Good evening and welcome to the Ballot Measure Forum on 101. Presented by the League of Women Voters of Portland, I'm Debbie Kay, moderator, and I represent the League this evening. My helper here and our forum's coordinator is Maud Nayral. The League of Women Voters works to help citizens make informed decisions in elections. The goal of this forum is to give all of you and our watchers and listeners the information that will be helpful as you cast your vote by January 23rd for Measure 101. Our guests this evening are Peter Graven from OHSU, Rachel Solotaroff from Central City Concern, and Lindsay Bershauer from Leona Consulting Company. We are really glad that you could come. A brief bio for each of them. Peter Graven is a health economist and research professor with the Center for Health Systems Effectiveness at Oregon Health and Science University. Oregon and the United States are trying to answer many questions about healthcare and its impact on cost, quality, and access. Dr. Graven's research tries to apply tools from economics and health services research to answer important policy questions. His research interests include health insurance, health economics, methodology, simulation modeling, state health policy, and program evaluation. And he probably knows what all of those are. <laughs> Speaking on behalf of the Yes for Healthcare campaign is Rachel Solotaroff, MD, President and CEO of Central City Concern, a major provider of housing, healthcare, and employment support to people experiencing homelessness in Portland. In her former role as Central City Concerns and Old Town Clinic's medical director and as chief medical officer, she has overseen inpatient and outpatient alcohol and drug treatment, primary care, and mental health care. She's developed key strategic initiatives and stakeholder partnerships to respond to community needs and has championed data-driven models of care for specific populations, from expansion of treatment for homeless people with opioid use disorder to an advanced medical home for medically complex homeless individuals. In 2014, Dr. Solitaroff received the Karen Rotondo Outstanding Service Award from the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council. Speaking on behalf of Oregon's Against More, More Healthcare Taxes campaign is Lindsay Bershauer, owner and president of Leona Consulting Company, a political and public affairs forum. Firm, excuse me. She started her involvement in Oregon public policy at Cascade Policy Institute, where she successfully argued against the 2011 $548 million Portland Public Schools bond measure, the largest school construction bond in Oregon history. From there, she joined Third Century Solutions as director of the Oregon Transformation Project. Project. Ms. Bershauer started her company in 2013 and aggressively opposed the Columbia River crossing. She helped preserve the state's small business tax cut. Ms. Bershauer is board president for Building Excellent Schools Together, a nonprofit group of Oregon mothers that support school choice, as well as a member of the Wilsonville Public Policy Council and board director for the Newburgh Rural Fire Protection District. Thank you very much to all of our speakers. Good evening and welcome. We'll begin our program tonight with Dr. Peter Graven, who will present factual information about Measure 101. Dr. Graven, please go ahead. Great. Well, thanks for being invited. Glad to be here. Um, I'm hoping I can help you with the decision that you're going to make. Hope you, hopefully you can hear me as well. No, you cannot. Hmm. We should be on. There you go. Oh, just need to get a little closer. All right. Um, yeah, so thanks for being invited. Thanks to be here. Uh, glad to be here. Um, I am here to help you make a decision. Um, I've, I'm a health economist. I'm not a legislative expert, but I've done my homework on this one as well as I can. I'm hoping to provide the information that you would go find if you had the time to spend to go do it. Um, I'd like to present it as factually as possible. You, ha you will, if my information isn't good enough, you'll also have two people who are going to help persuade you um, uh, towards one side or the other. I'd like to start off with a little background so we know how we got here. Um, I think that the story begins back when we were thinking about the budget gap from last uh, that went into the new biennium. 
So as we recall, the bienniums are two year periods that we, we go through all the process to get the budget to work. And the last time we finished up with that process is the end of June. And during that time, there was a large budget gap. And this budget gap was about 1.4 billion. It moved around a little bit, but sometimes it was higher than that. But 1.4 billion is a, is a common number to use. And at that time, there, um, there was a lot of different ways that could go about it. There had been a Measure 97, which you may recall was, was attempted in uh, the fall of 2016, and that measure failed. That would have been a whole bunch of new money that went into Oregon. That didn't pass, and similar types of measures that were or organized around a corporate uh, uh, receipts tax of, of, of that type, um, they, they were discussed but did never, never came up for vote. And so we had this gap. Um, the drivers are, are probably important to know. It's hard to always tell what were the real drivers of a budget gap. Um, spending in the, for, the, for the budget, you, money comes in, money goes out. It doesn't always have a name on it. And so probably the most commonly held belief was that there were certainly increases that we saw in both PERS spending um, that's something people have known about for a long time, and also in healthcare. And so, part of the increase in healthcare was due to the fact that there was um, a, a large chunk of money that had been coming in from the federal government to help with transformation of our uh, Medicaid program, and those monies had 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 run out. And so, therefore, we we're dealing with um, some new obligations, both from that uh, from commitments made for that, and as well as the Medicaid expansion. And so, many people know that this was a program that was begun um, with 100% federal financing. And then over time, the state was picking up a larger and larger share. And that begins at, uh, um, well, right now we're at about uh, uh, 6% um, and, or 5% and we're gonna get to 6%. And so it's a small percent, but the Medicaid program is very expensive and therefore even a small share of that hit the state budget um, and, and was noticeable. And so a variety of factors are all contributing to a budget gap. The state um, was, um, and, and like I said, the uh, ballot measure 97 did not pass. Similar other le legislation did not come up. And so towards the end of the session, they um, House Bill 2391 was one of the House bills that was passed in order to make the budget balance. And the um, it provided about $600 million in revenue for over a two-year period. And that um, is not the 1.4, but that in combination with other measures was able to close the budget gap and, and balance the budget. Um, there were some other bills that were involved that were cutting costs at the same time. Um, and after the bill was passed, um, We'll, and we'll talk about the taxes that were involved and the, the assessments that were involved. The, um, then um, after that, there was ballot measure 101, which is aimed, um, what we're here to talk about today, which is aimed at that um, House Bill 2391. And there was, a, I believe, 51 sections in that House Bill. Five of them are addressed by ballot measure 101. And so these are, but they're big ones, right? These are the ones that are addressing the revenues that are being generated by that House bill. And so that ballot measure obtained the necessary signatures and then is now put forth before the voters. So the choice for the ballot measure is yes, and that's going to continue the uh, specific revenue provisions of that House bill. Those include a 1.5% assessment on insurance premiums that is um, assessed on insurers, um, MCOs, which are managed care organizations. They're also called coordinated care organizations in Oregon. Those are very similar. Um, and then also the Public Employees Benefit Board, PEB, um, which provides the health insurance for public employees in the state. Um, as insure, as like an insurer, they're making a payment as well, and that's at a 1.5% rate of their premiums. There's also an assessment of 0.7% of all hospital revenues uh, for, you could think of, they're called DRG hospitals. They're essentially larger hospitals that, that um, are, can take a little bit more risk. And there's a new um, assessment of 4.0% on smaller hospitals called type A and B hospitals. 
Uh, there was other revenue that's not being addressed by the ballot measure that was part of the original House bill. Um, and so the yes vote is going to continue these assessments on both insurers and on hospitals. A no vote is going to strike those specific revenue sections. There's five of them. Um, and they are um, specifically the insurer assessment is going to be blocked. And also, and their ability to, uh, one of the sections in the House bill is to uh, allow the insurers to, they're getting assessed 1.5% uh, to pass that cost on in the form of premium increases through uh, whether or not that's in the exchange or, or elsewhere. And so one of the sections is to allow insurers to pass on that cost. Um, the hospital assessment is a little bit trickier right now. Um, it it um, is designed to be, um, to be uh, blocked. Um, there is some readings of it that are, at least my, my understanding of it, are a little unclear as to whether or not it's, it's going to be fully blocked or not. Um, so we, we might hear more about that. Um, the question then becomes, so you have a yes or no, what happens next with those two options? If yes, the assessments are, will be maintained and the existing programs will be funded as specified from the Legislative Assembly. Uh, the incidence of those assessments, which um, are relevant for uh, voters as they think about it, um, are not always totally known. So this is something economists like to think about. If you if you if you uh, assess some money on one person, how are, how is it going to affect others? And it depends a little bit. For insurers, we have a pretty good idea that they have already passed on their 1.5 percent into rates, particularly in the exchange where those. Um, where those rates are very closely reviewed. Um, the, on the other side, on, for the hospitals, it's going to be less clear. So if they have a 0.7% um, increase in cost based on the revenue, whether or not that gets paid out from increased prices on their services or if that comes out of reserves, depending on their financial situation, um, they haven't said and we don't know exactly what will happen from that. So that's worth knowing. Um, if no, so if, if the vote is no, uh, then the, the, the assessments in that area are going to be canceled. Um, and the legislature will then therefore have a budget gap that redevelops because the fewer revenue is going to be coming in. They are required constitutionally to balance that budget. So there happens to be a, a session coming up in February where that would be addressed. And so that, that gap, which is uh, expected to be uh, between 210 and I think $340 million, um, is, it would have to be addressed by the legislature. And uh, that will lead to essentially three options you could imagine for the legislature. Um, one is they could cut health um, healthcare and Medicaid or the reinsurance program. They could cut other state spending to make up that gap or they could raise revenue. And those are questions that we don't know the answer to. They may state what they're going to do, but at this time, um, we, that certainty is not there. Um, those are the main points I wanted to um, uh, help you know about. I hope it has been helpful. Thank you very much. Audience members, if you have questions about Measure 101 to ask of our speakers, please raise your hand and the League member will bring you a three by five card and a writing instrument if you need it. Um, write your question, raise your hand, and ask that person to take it over here. Next, each of our yes and no speakers will give a three-minute opening statement. We'll follow the opening statements with questions for each of our speakers who will have one minute to respond to each question. Timekeepers, thank you very much. In the front row, we'll signal a 15-second warning and then stop when the speaker's time has expired. Thank you, timekeepers. Let's begin with Rachel Solitaroff. Three minutes, please. Well, thank you so much for having me here today. Thank you to the League of Women Voters. Um, for those of you not familiar with Central City Concern, we're an organization whose mission is to provide comprehensive solutions to ending homelessness. So to that end, we provide over 8,500 individuals in the Portland area with comprehensive health care that's inclusive of primary care, mental health, and addictions. We have 1,800 units of housing, soon to be 2,200, um, housing over 
2,000 people every night, and we provide supportive employment to about 1,200 people per year, placing them with employers, um, with over 500 employers in the city. So what our approach does is it moves people out of homelessness, out of poverty and addiction to become thriving members of the community. And to support this work, it's worth knowing that we have nearly 900 employees, half of whom have lived experience themselves of homelessness, of addiction, of poverty. And we have an annual operating budget of over $90 million. So this impact, this work, would not be possible with the Medicaid, without Medicaid expansion, with that bulk of, of uh, Medicaid dollars that Measure 101 will protect. Of our 8,500 clients, about 60% of them gained access to health care with Medicaid expansion. And with that expansion, with that access to care, we've had really demonstrable impacts. We've impacted the opioid epidemic by providing evidence-based treatment for opioid use disorder to people who never had access to it before. We've outreached on the street to people with serious mental illness, providing them with psychiatric care, medication, case management, counseling, access to housing. We've improved our treatment of chronic pain and have lowered opioid prescribing in this state. We've demonstrated improvements in quality across many healthcare measures from diabetes and cancer screening to hepatitis C and depression. And as noted earlier, we've worked with our CCOs to really develop innovative and value-based models of care that not only improve outcomes, but help to, help to decrease healthcare costs. And we see these types of improvements in CCOs across the state with better care, with healthier people, and with smarter spending. Measure 101 guarantees that we can continue this work, that we can build upon the gains and improvements that we've made in the last four years. Measure 101 is the only way to pave that path forward. I started practicing as a physician at a community health center in Oregon a little bit after 2004 when we were unable to raise funds to fund the Oregon Health Plan. And I watched and I took care of people as 100,000 people were disenrolled from the Oregon Health Plan and the havoc and destruction that was wreaked by that. We can't go through that again. I'm heartened by the 165 organizations and 10 newspapers that have endorsed Measure 101, and I encourage you to listen tonight and ask questions and then vote yes on the measure on January 23rd. Thank you. Ms. Burschauer, your turn for an opening statement. Three minutes, please. Well, thank you for having me tonight. Um, I first want to talk about why we're here. I want you to know why this is in front of you. And the fact of the matter is when the legislature passed House Bill 2391, a very small portion of the health care budget, mind you, this is a $13.69 billion budget, and we're talking about, about 5%. It's about $330 million. When the legislature passed that, there were a couple of uh, state representatives who have intimate experience with the Medicaid system. One of them grew up on Medicaid. The other one is a Medicaid practitioner. He's a dentist. They decided that they wanted to ask Oregonians if they thought that that revenue stream, those two new revenue streams, were fair. So they went out and talked to the state, and lo and behold, 90,000 Oregonians signed a petition in 90 days to force this to the, to the ballot. And that's why this is in front of you today. What is Measure 101? It's a 1.5% tax on anybody who purchases a plan on the exchange. So if you purchase as an individual, as a, as a family, a small business, a larger business on the, on the larger group market, uh, nonprofits, college students who have to have health insurance uh, as, a, as a requirement of their residency, and schools. School districts buy their health insurance on the large group market. So we're talking about a $25 million hit to our school districts if these taxes go through. Who doesn't pay? Large corporations like Nike and Intel were exempted from these taxes. Unions are exempted from the taxes. Dr. Gavin talked a little bit about PEB, those are the public employee um, Benefit Board, PEB was actually paid their tax bill by taxpayers. They received $12 million from taxpayers out of the general fund to cover this tax. So they're, they're sitting pretty happy right now. They don't have to pay anymore. And, you, and insurance companies themselves were carved out as well. 
So what will happen if you vote no? If you vote no on January 24th, no one is going to lose their health insurance. These commercials, the fancy commercials, the glossy mail your, mailers in your, um, in your mailboxes that say 350,000 people are going to lose health insurance is absolutely false. That number has changed about five times, by the way. The fact of the matter is the state has a year's worth of Medicaid funding already on the books, and we are talking about a very small portion of the Medicaid health care budget. So we have ideas that do not include taxing Oregonians on their health care plans and hospitals to cover the Medicaid funding. We have a whole laundry list of ideas, and these legislators are ready to get back to work and solve that problem. In sum, we urge a no vote because taxing, taxing the health care of the certain part of the state that can afford it the least is not only inequitable and unfair, but it is unsustainable. So please vote no by January 23rd. Thank you. We're going to begin with some questions now, and I'll remind audience members, if you have them, send them along. But please, write them legibly. Our first question, and each of you will have a minute to respond. Please explain the specific types of healthcare organizations that would actually be paying for this assessment. And if you can, give by name examples of ones in Portland that would be paying. Dr. Graven, we'll start with you. If well, you wish, sure. Uh, it, uh, as well as I can, the 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 three groups that have been that are cited as insurers that are paying. So there's insurers, MCOs or CCOs, and then um, I also mentioned PEB. And so on the insurer side, those are names like Moda, um, Cambia, also sometimes thought of as Regents or Blue Cross, and then also. Um, uh, Providence as an insurance plan. These are all insurers that would be paying that 1.5%. It's on plans that they have that are in the large or small group market or individual market. On the MCO and CCO side, these are names like HealthShare of Oregon, which is a CCO. You'd also have, um, uh, let's see, some, well, Moda also has one there. There's, um, that's in Eastern Oregon and a few others. Um, and then, of course, PEB, as was mentioned, PEB, because of their funding, um, that was an internal transfer within the state. So, Thank you. Ms. Bershaw, do you want to add anything to that? This is, this is part of the problem. So I, he mentioned uh, most of them, but that's part of the problem. They were given in the bill, they were given explicit permission to pass along the 1.5% tax onto the ratepayers, and And that's for the insurance companies. If you think about CCOs, CCOs, their entire business model is predicated on your tax dollars. So if there's an increase in taxes or increase in cost, who do you think pays for that? It's the taxpayers. And what we're saying is that this form of taxation, these two new forms of taxation, where you're going after Oregonians who are purchasing their own healthcare and paying full freight for their own healthcare is unfair. A lot of people are paying more for healthcare right now than they are for their own mortgage and rent payments. So how is it equitable that we're going after those people to pay for the expansion of Medicaid when we've left half of the state exempt from paying these taxes? Thank you. Dr. Solitaroff, do you want to add anything? Well, I would add that of the organizations that will be paying this assessment, all of them have endorsed the measure, and that is a value that those organizations have from Kaiser to OHSU to HealthShare of Oregon to protect the health care of Oregonians. The other thing that's worth noting that um, Dr. Graven didn't mention is that House Bill 2391 also funds a reinsurance program. So what these assessments would help to do would be to lower by 6% or about $300 a year the health care premiums for all of those individuals who buy their health insurance on the individual market. So there's a sizable chunk of Oregonians who would see protections and around because of Measure 101 and House Bill 2391 because of the reinsurance program. Can you all please explain reinsurance? And starting with Ms. Bershauer. 
Sure. So when they say reinsurance and it's going to lower premiums by $300, what they're really saying is that reinsurance is another fancy word for subsidization. Who do you think pays the reinsurance? It's everybody on the small and large group markets. They are paying to subsidize the individual markets because when the ACA went into an effect, we signed up about 100,000 less people on the individual market than we needed to sustain that program. So now the, the small and large group folks are paying to subsidize and, and tamp down their rates. It's simply a transfer of money. So this notion that it somehow reduces your, your premium by $300 is simply false. Dr. Gavin, do you want to add anything to that? Uh so re reinsurance programs are designed to pay for expensive individuals that exist in a market. And so if an individual has a very high cost in that year, um, it can present a lot of variability to an insurer who is uh, worried about making sure that their premiums add up to their uh, their costs. And so therefore, what has been shown in different areas is that reinsurance programs are attractive to insurers because if there's a insurance plan that is covering the high cost individuals, then they set a premium for the ones who don't cost a lot. And so as was stated, it ends up as a reduction in the cost um, as a um, for the total premium because the insurer no longer is taking the risk on the high cost individuals. Dr. Solotaroff, anything from you on that one? Yes, I would just say that in terms of the number of lives on the exchange, the I mean, one of the issues is that we have an, a very high coverage rate in Oregon, in part due to the number of people who are eligible for Medicaid. And so that's part of what's taking, taking into account the, um, the numbers of people on the exchange, and that Measure 101 allows us to secure the ongoing funding for those individuals on Medicaid. Thank you. Please explain how Measure 101 will impact the federal match that helps support Medicaid and hospital costs. Uh, starting with Dr. Um, Solitara. Sure. So there are lots of different nuances to what gets matched and how much. And I will say, in all full disclosure, I'm a I'm not a government affairs or Medicaid expert, but of the about 210 to 320 million dollars that um, Measure 101 would support, that will be matched about three to one, as I understand it, by the federal government. So it would draw down about 840 to 1. 840 million to 1.3 billion dollars total, including that federal match. So that, so when. Um, when we talk about um, this being a tiny, you know, a small portion or 5% of the total Medicaid budget, or, that's not entirely true because we would also be losing a significant amount of funding from the federal match to the total tune of possibly $1.2 billion. Thank you. Um, does anyone, uh, Dr. Graven, do you want to say anything about how this match impacts? Um, I guess a little more information is that it does vary by the different eligibility groups. And so um, some eligibility groups will have a match that is higher or lower. Um, the Medicaid expansion group, which was the most recent one that started in 2014 for low income um, adults and, um, and other individuals, um, has a very high match at this point. So it is around 95%. Uh, um, and will eventually increase or decrease, I guess you could say, to a 90% match. Um, other programs are, I think, are closer to like six, 65% or so. And Ms. Brashar. So the problem that we have with these uh, two main taxes, the 1.5% and the 0.7% on hospitals, is that hospitals in this state work, in, in effect, like a bank. State money goes in, it gets matched by the feds, and the, and the hospitals act in this closed loop like a bank. This 0.7% hospital tax is outside of that. It is not in that closed loop assessment. So we're leaving money actually on the table because it's outside of that. And the taxes that are raised by Measure 101 go straight into the general fund. They are not obligated to use them for health care. They are completely fungible. 
We have a le legislative opinion from the legal counsel that says, yes, these taxes can be swept to use for other purposes. We have a problem with that. Thank you. I want to remind the audience in, when you send questions in that these questions will be answered by all the speakers if they wish to. So you don't need to direct them to a particular person. It's uh, our understanding that this ballot measure has a two-year impact. What happens after that? Uh, Ms. Bershauer. So I think um, a lot of us fear, at least, at least on the no side, is that if these taxes go through in two years, the federal government is going to be refunding less, a smaller percentage, as Dr. Graham talked about. So what happens when you create two new spigots of revenue in Measure 101 and suddenly your portion of Medicaid funding uh, balloons in the next biennium? Well, uh, the... Union lobbyists for SEIU said in, in a debate last week that they will simply raise the rates, and that is the fear, that certain Oregonians are going to be targeted, the ones who are buying their health insurance and paying full freight are going to be targeted for higher and higher taxation on their health insurance plans uh, because the Medicaid budget is growing and the federal government is reimbursing less. Thank you. Um, Dr. Slotar, do you have anything you want to add? add that the, the, the CCO model is built to contain costs. Already we save because of the bending of the cost curve with the CCOs, saving on the order of about $600 million in state funds. Preserving a CCO model allows us to build upon the type of work that I mentioned earlier, where we are improving quality of care and decreasing our total spending. If you blow up that system and leave people without care, you're in a much worse state two years from now than you than you would be having protected that funding. We need to build upon the secure foundation that we have to then continue to make gains around improved care and decreased costs. Thank you. Dr. Graven, anything to add? I'll pass. OK. The Oregon legislature knew in 2014 that Medicaid expansion, um, the federal funding for it, would drop from 100% to 94%, and nothing was done to prepare until 2016. A yes vote. Does a yes vote enable a short-sighted legislature? Dr. Solitaro. So I, it's a good, I think I would um, just echo what I said earlier, which is that if you, if you say the answer to this problem is to destroy the system and to say, let's refer it back to the legislature, and we can talk maybe at some point about what, what the timing really is and the possibility for a list of solutions to fund a Medicaid gap, which personally I have zero confidence in. The pathway forward is to continue to build upon the foundation that we have. If we're trying to teach the legislature and the healthcare community a lesson by saying you should have prepared for this, I'll tell you who pays the price. The people who pay the price are the people that I take care of. There's an old saying, when two elephants fight, it's the grass that suffers. And what we will end up seeing is people being disenrolled from the Oregon health plan, our rates of uninsured going up, our health care quality, and many other measures dropping in our community. And that's what the impact will be. Dr. Graven? Um, I guess I can say a little bit more about this. I, I, did, I was part of a study back in 2013 that looked at this very question, which was, what is going to be the financial impact on the state of expanding Medicaid? And indeed, the, there, um, there's um, a, a couple extra issues that are worth thinking about. When Medicaid dollars come in from the federal government, they represent um, new economic activity. Um, and that, um, as part of this study, is shown was shown that there's tax revenue that gets generated by that. Um, and so, one thing to um, think about is whether or not um, all of the whether or not Medicaid expansion really was not fully funded or was not fully considered or not. The study that we looked at said that maybe there was. Um, uh, places where the savings could occur uh, due to lowered uninsured and other other elements. Um, now, the enrollment was higher than had been anticipated at that time. Um, the cost may change over time. But there are other um, 
aspects to the decision to uh, expand Medicaid than simply the, the, the cost for the state. Thank you. Ms. Burchar. The people who will pay the price for the legislature's decision are people like Stan Buck, who is an 83-year-old retired master sergeant in Walport who is spending half of his military pension on an individual plan for his 55-year-old daughter who was injured in an accident and, dis and is disabled. Mr. Buck will pay this tax. Those people, those Oregonians, there are about 250,000 of them across this state, are going to pay the price for this decision. There is a more equitable way to get this done. It is not about blowing up Medicaid. It's not about any of that. No, none of these chief petitioners have any interest in doing that. It's about finding a more equitable way to solve this budget hole. Thank you. It's, I've read that 49 states use this or some similar type of assessment to manage this funding challenge. Can you please speak to that? Ms. Burschauer, starting with you. Uh, there are other states that use this type of, of revenue. Um, I think what we're arguing, though, is that these are two new revenue streams. And why do they need two new revenue streams that go directly into the general fund and aren't actually allocated for health care spending? And if you look at what's happened over the past couple of years, the, the headlines that you've read uh, in the Oregonian and other papers, we have seen a billion dollars of our tax dollars wasted through the Oregon Health Authority on failed IT projects and you name it. We just spent, we just sent the CCOs $64 million in wrongful payments. What happens if the government sends you a $64 million tax refund and you cash it knowing that you don't, it doesn't belong to you? You think they're gonna want that back? Of course, and this is what's happening in the OHA. What we're arguing is that there is a laundry list of things that we should be going after before we start taxing certain Oregonians' health care plans and hospitals. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Solitaro. Yeah, so I just want to echo that idea that this is a, some, a tried and true method in 49 other states and correct a couple of things that Ms. Burschauer was saying. One is that the 0.7% tax on hospitals does pull down a federal match. It's a true tax, meaning that the hospitals, a true assessment, meaning that the hospitals pay it, but it does pull down that federal match. And that is why this matching mechanism is used in many states around the country. Secondly, it is it is very clear in the House Bill 2391 legislation that these funds are are to be used for to be used in healthcare pools for healthcare dollars. If you go and read the legislation, you can look at it on the state legislative page. That is that is very clear that that money can't be it is not fungible and isn't swept to the general fund. And finally, the idea that these are brand new revenue streams is also not true. The premium tax is how we funded healthy kids insurance from 2009 to 2013. It's a tried and true mechanism to allow us to be able to raise money to fund people, and that's why it's being brought back again. Thank you. Dr. Graven, anything? I'll pass. Okay. One of the five elements of uh, this series of assessments that we haven't talked about yet is the 4% on other hospitals. And you describe them, Dr. Graven, as being type A, type B, rural. Can you elaborate on that, please, and explain how they got there and what that means? Yeah, so the, um, traditionally the, the, the hospital assessment was, uh, was on larger hospitals that are called the DRG hospitals in Oregon. And the idea being, for most part, their financial situation is a lot different than small hospitals in small towns. And those smaller hospitals had historically not paid this assessment. Um, however, they're, they're, um, they are un for consideration um, here. And... Um, if I'm not mistaken, are not included in the block uh, part of is part of the ballot measure, so that that 4.0 percent to type A and B hospitals would, will happen regardless. Oh, okay. It's only the 0.7 percent on the large DRG hospitals that is being addressed by the ballot measure. Thank you for setting me and perhaps others of you straight. Uh, any arguments or discussion about that from anyone else? Yeah, I would, I would like to comment on that. Um, 
The 0.7% tax on hospitals is, as, as uh, and the doctor said, a true tax, which means it's outside of that closed loop assessment, which means it will be passed down to you. How, why do you think hospital associations are spending $2.5 million to convince you to please raise their taxes? We want to pay these taxes out of the goodness of our heart. Of course not. They are going to be passed down to anybody who walks through a hospital door or uses the services of a hospital. And I want to correct because there is a legislative council opinion that says that these taxes are fungible. So I please, I encourage you to look at that because we actually asked that question. We wanted to know, can these dollars be swept for something else? Are they going to be used for something else? And the legislative council said, yes, that is possible. Thank you. A question uh, from the audience. What would be the most appropriate way to fund the Medicaid match? Ms. Bershauer, you mentioned other ideas that would be more equitable. And the uh, questioner from the audience wonders, where were those ideas uh, during the legislative session last year? Have there been other ways proposed? And what happened to them? I realize you're not a legislator. Sure. Yes. Uh, and I have one minute to get this done. So. <laughs> so in the last session, there were actually several other bills that would have closed this budget gap without raising uh, taxes on, on health plans. One of them was a tobacco tax. And, and mainly, it was a target on the behavior, the human behavior that actually affects the healthcare industry, right? Whether you agree with the tobacco tax or not. What we've said is, look, 63,000 people were found to be ineligible for Medicaid. They are no longer on the, on the Medicaid rolls. And when they did House Bill 2391, when they did the budget, they counted those people. So you can back off $100 million out of this budget hole already because that's what those people represented. $64 million in wrongful payments to CCOs. We need to go get that back. The governor herself said we need to go get that back. We have $47 million in extra revenue. This state is doing very well. The economy is up. Uh, the, the, econo the economists said we have about $47 million more coming in. Let's pull from that. The Trump uh, tax reform plan, love him or hate him, it's going to produce about $150 to $200 million a year for or a windfall for Oregon. There are other ways to get this done. Thank you. Dr. Graven? I'm not going to. Okay. Dr. Solitaro. Yeah, so I would um, contest this. I, the reason that I'm here, the reason we s spend our days and evenings and weekends doing this is not because I'm a special interest. It's because I have zero confidence. I have heard nothing that gives me any assurance that in a short session, our legislature will be able to go back and create funding mechanisms, ne mechanisms that will support the work that Measure 101 would guarantee. A tobacco tax tobacco tax didn't pass in 2007 for children's health insurance. That was a $13 million campaign that failed because it didn't have the votes. The, um, the opportunity to say we're going to just magically find money through these inefficiencies, also you don't write a budget that way. The caseload determinations were, based, were done by economists in a publicly vetted process that projected caseloads through the biennium, and that's what, we're, that's what Medi Measure 101 is based on. There's no magic money. If we get hundreds of millions of dollars from, um, from tax cuts from Trump, we have a kicker in this state and that money is going to go back to the to the voters. So I don't I have there's no magic money and I have zero confidence that we'll be able to go into the legislature and recoup it in such a short period of time. Thank you. What is the reason that large companies self-funded health insurance programs are not included in this assessment? Dr. Solitaroff. So and not being an insurance expert, self-insured plans um, or self-insured companies, as Ms. Bershauer was referred to, are regulated by the federal government. That is, they we are not as a state legally able to um, levy taxes or assessments upon that. So it's not that this is a conspiracy by large corporations to escape paying their share through because they are these, I believe what's called ERISA plans, they are federally um, regulated, and we as a state legally cannot levy taxes upon them. Dr. Raven? Um, that's my understanding as well. As for the, it, it, it's just related to their uh, status as being uh, uh, 
when you're self-insured, it's essentially like you're a, a business and you're not an insured. And so therefore you don't, you're, you're not, uh, the state insurance laws do not apply. And Ms. Brashar. Well, there have been folks who have been trying to find more equitable ways to fund Medicaid, and there is a Sixth Circuit Court opinion in Michigan that says that ERISA plans are considered personal property, and therefore, they can be taxed. So Nike, depending on how many people they employ and how many people they provide health care coverage for, could be assigned a per-head tax, and that payment would go to our state government to help fund Medicaid. Look. If Medicaid is a shared societal responsibility, then it makes absolutely no sense that we are targeting a very specific portion of our population to pay for these increases, and we are holding large corporations harmless. Following up on that, are there other health care entities that could be assessed and the assessment used legally for Medicaid? Which would they be? And should or could they be added in this session or when the federal match rate decreases again and more state match is needed? Ms. Bershauer. I would refer to Dr. Graven on that. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I haven't thought about that question, so I don't think I have a, a great answer for other, I mean, there are obviously other entities you can think about in the healthcare industry are, um, there's clinics. Um, there's clinics, um, but I, I don't know of specific taxes or taxes or assessments that have been applied to them for this purpose. So I'm not familiar with other other entities mm -hmm. that could be taxed in that way. And and I would add that you know a large coalition, a bipartisan coalition, spent six months coming up with House Bill 2391. I guess I would I would beg the audience to ask, do we then want to say we're going to throw all that away and figure out in a short session with a limited period of time how we're going to start looking for other sources of funding when we have had six months of a bipartisan large coalition process. I'll add one thing also, is that there's an opportunity cost to taking our legislative short session and devoting it entirely to health care. There's a particular piece of legislation called the document recording fee, which could have an enormous impact on creating a sustainable mechanism for funding for affordable housing at this point in the state. Trying to fill the gap left by a no vote on Measure 101 would suck all of the air out of this legislative session and leave no opportunity for other types of meaningful legislation to be passed, and that would be an enormous, at enormous cost to Oregon. And I'd actually like to use some of my time to respond. I think that's what most Oregonians feel that, that we um, pay and elect them to do, right? That's their job, is to figure this out. And if Oregonians say that taxing health insurance plans for anybody who's buying on the exchange or taxing hospitals that are, and the tax is going to be passed down to patients is wrong and unfair and inequitable, then that's their job is to go back and get it right and figure it out. And that's what the February session is for. And it's literally a week after the, the election and they will have an opportunity to do that. Thank you. Related, and you've, you've all addressed this, I think, in certain ways, but perhaps not fully, what is likely to be the impact of uninsured people on health care costs to both health care insurance companies and to the insured? We start with you, Ms. Bershauer. The question is, what is the impact of the in uninsured? Mm -hmm. Well, look, we have... Um, the Medicaid funding has actually gone from about $3 billion to start around $3 billion. We're now up towards $8 billion. So we've been... We now have over a million Oregonians on uh, Medicaid or related health care plans. And I think the question isn't how the uninsured is going to impact the system. I think it's how we actually sustain that and continue to provide health care for these folks. Um, I'm a taxpayer. I want my taxpayers' tax dollars to be spent wisely, but I also expect the legislature to prioritize and protect our most vulnerable populations. And I don't feel like that's getting done, and I certainly don't feel like taxing certain Oregonians on their health care plans is the way to do it. Dr. Graven, you want to add anything? Uh, let's see. I guess there there are estimates from the literature on the impact of uninsurance on premiums. The most commonly known one I use is that about 1.1% of the uh, premium is due to un uh, is due to uninsurance 
And so um, that's a small estimate that, um, but adds up to a very large amount um, across all pr uh, private premiums. A more recent estimate I did see that is actually in the last six months is that it um, that expanding Medicaid and that could be both Medicaid or uninsured becoming um, getting Medicaid decreased uh, individual market premiums by about five percent. I think that's a really thank you. It's a really critical point that taking people off of the insurance rolls, the same people that Ms. Bershauer is trying to protect are going to pay are going to pay significantly through cost shifting. If folks are uninsured by not having Medicaid coverage, they no longer utilize primary care and preventative care, and instead they seek the most expensive care that is, they seek the, they seek the only care that is available to them, which happens to be the most expensive care, which is through the emergency department in the hospital. Those costs then get passed on through hospital rates as well as through insurance premiums and then all everybody in Oregon ends up paying that price in a way that really has overall lowered the quality of care in addition to increasing costs in the state. It's not it's not a sustainable or viable solution whereas as Dr. Graven pointed out enabling people to have access to coverage will lower those costs statewide. Thank you. The Oregonian editorial board wrote that Oregonians should vote no on Measure 101 to stand up against the inequity of this tax and demand that lawmakers find a fairer way to meet the Medicaid obligation. Former Governor and Dr. John Kitzhaber agrees that funding for the Oregon Health Plan is a shared social responsibility, but argues that jeopardizing health insurance coverage for 350,000 Oregonians to make that point is equally unfair and unnecessary. What would each of you consider to be the most fair outcome? Starting with you, Dr. Solitaro. Oh man, that's a hard one. Um, I think that a fair outcome is investing in a model that has demonstrated that it bends the cost curve, that improves healthcare outcomes, that pulls, that through the improved healthcare outcomes helps to decrease funding in other parts of the, other parts of the state budget. As people are off the streets, out of jails, and in um, and in employment, such as what we accomplish at Central City Concern, we are you are decreasing costs in um, to kids in DHS custody. You're decreasing costs for in the correction system. You're decreasing costs from lost wages, and you're also enabling a much broader swath of the community to achieve meaningful lives. That's a demonstrated model that works, and that's what is equitable and fair and ultimately improves the quality of life and lowers, lowers statewide budget costs across the board. Dr. Graven, anything? No, I, I'm not going to comment okay. on that. Ms. Bershauer. Well, notice that she was careful not to say taxing certain people's health care plans is a more fair and equitable way. And that's really the point, right? It's about being better stewards of our tax dollars. We spend billions of dollars in our health care budgets and on our Medicaid system. And we've seen the waste that's gone on. We've seen this happen in front of our eyes. And I think when you when we hear things like health care is a basic human right, it should be affordable and accessible to all. And yet they're standing in front of people saying, but that means for you, you get a tax on your health care plan. How is that fair? How does that make their health care more accessible and affordable? I was on Moda. My premiums went up 20% a year on Moda. And this is on top of that. This is unsustainable. These folks are the ones who are paying full freight for their health care, and they are doing it, in some cases, simply to comply with the ACA. It is inequitable to target them and unfair to target them to pay for the expansion of Medicaid. Our final question, therefore, what new tax on Oregonians would be appropriate to match the budget gap? Would a medical tax on all Oregonians' net income be a better solution? Starting with you. Well, I don't believe we need new taxes. I think this state's doing actually very well. We've come back from the recession and we have record revenue and we don't need new tax. 
What happens in the legislature when they go to do the budget? What do you think they pass first? They pass all of their special interest goodies first, and then they get to the end of the session and they say, oh, whoops, we've got to pass the education and healthcare budgets, and there's not enough money. Why do you think that is? And so the only solution every single time seems to be increased taxes. In Measure 97, Oregonians saw right through that and they said, no, we are not going to approve new sales taxes on health care, groceries, goods, services. And they sent the legislature a message and said, we need more equitable funding that doesn't involve taxing us more. I've mentioned some of the other options. There are, there's a laundry list more, and these legislators who are committed to protecting Medicaid are ready to go back in February and get this done in a better way. Thank you. Dr. Graven, you want to add anything? No, I'll pass. Dr. Solitaro. I, <clears throat> I, I don't have an answer to that. Again, the legislator went, legislature went and they did their job. They spent six months coming up with a bipartisan large coalition solution to enable us to continue Medicaid funding, funding that would create greater gains down the road. Just... There's a, a colleague of mine said recently, there's, this isn't kindergarten, there's no take backs. I don't think they're excited to go back and come up with a whole new way. And there's, I have, again, zero confidence that that's going to happen. And there are other compelling legislative priorities which need to be taken up in this short session, particularly around issues that can address our crisis around affordable housing in this state. So Measure 101 is our only option. There is no plan B. That's the end of our questions. Please join me in thanking our speakers. Oh my gosh, you're right, they do. You get closing statements. Thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, Dr. Graven, you get to go first. Well, um, I, I failed to mention um, that um, while my title is at OHSU, I should mention to you all that um, my views that I've expressed here in no way reflect OHSU as a hospital or any relationship they have with insurers. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Solitaro. Sure. Well, thanks again. And as I mentioned earlier, a number of times, Measure 101 is our only option going forward. There are 165 organizations. We have 10 newspapers that you can see in the back that support it, not because they're financially invested or trying to get the little guy, but because it's the right thing to do for the health of Oregonians, both in health care and fiscally. It's the only way to guarantee access to our health care. And we've heard this before, just repeal it and go back and we'll figure something out. But that's not our value here. Our value is to provide health care to all Oregonians, maintain our 95% coverage rate that we have. Let's not go backwards to rationing health care like we did in 2004 and beyond. And also, please join us if you're interested in canvassing this weekend, knocking on doors on Saturday. Senator Merkley will be joining us on Sunday for a canvassing campaign after that. Thanks so much. Thank you. Ms. Burschauer. If healthcare is a basic human right that should be affordable and accessible to all, then, we, then there's absolutely no excuse for the taxes in Measure 101 to be targeted at folks who are trying to provide health insurance for themselves and their family. It is inequitable, it's unsustainable, and it's unfair. And it is not the only option. Do not buy that. 350,000 Oregonians are not going to lose their health care on January 24th. The legislature will go back into the session and figure it out. What I will say is that, and I want to remind you what I started with, 90,000 Oregonians are the ones who put this in front of you. It is the entire reason we are having this conversation and having this election. They are asking you to stand with them and help protect them from these harmful taxes. And we urge you to vote no by January 23rd. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you to our timers. Thank you to my uh, uh, to Maud sitting with me. The League of Women Voters of Portland, again, thanks each of our speakers for participating. We thank the Multnomah Bar Foundation for its support and also our media partner, Metro East Community Media, for broadcasting the forum on its cable channels. And it will be posted to the League of Women Voters uh, YouTube 
channel later this week. Please check our website, lwvpdx.org, for uh, access to that, and tell your friends. There's a resource sheet at the back table, information from the League of Women Voters on this measure. It is neutral and balanced information, as we do for all elections, voters' guides. Remember, as has been stated, election day is January 23rd. Today, January 9th, is the last day for counties to mail ballots to voters. Completed ballots must be delivered to an official drop-off site uh, in Oregon no later than 8 o'clock Tuesday, January 23rd, or mailed to arrive by that date, and postmarks do not count. The League of Women Voters of Portland's next public meeting on Voices of Homelessness will be February 13th at 7 o'clock here in the Multnomah County Building. Please check our website, lwvpdx.org, for details on speakers. I'm Debbie Kay for the League of Women Voters of Portland. Thank you very much for watching our Ballot Measure Forum. Please be informed, and remember, your vote is very important. Thank you. Thank you.